Remember that major scandal regarding Donald Trump and a tape call crushing Georgia's Secretary of State to find the votes to overturn the election? There's now a huge development in that story. A special grand jury that investigated election interference by the former twice impeached president recommended indictments of multiple people on a range of charges. The special grand jury's forewoman, Emily Kors, told the New York Times that, quote, it is not a short list. Late today, NBC's Blaine Alexander also sat down with Coors for her first televised interview. She shared more on what to expect from that list. So we're talking about more than a dozen people? I would say that, yes. Okay. Are these recognizable names, names that people would know? There are certainly names that you would recognize. Did the grand jury recommend an indictment of former President Trump? I'm not going to speak on exact indictments. I Being don't think indictment. I don't think that there are any giant plot twists coming. I don't think that there are any like giant That's not the way I expected this to go at all. Mm. I I don't think that's in store for anyone. Joining me now is Democratic strategist Kurt Bardella and Barbara McQuaid, former U.S. attorney, professor at the University of Michigan School of Law and MSNBC legal analyst. Barbara, I'll start with you. I, I, I was riveted by that interview because the, 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 the forewoman seems like somebody who, like, one survivor, but she's got to wait a couple of months because of the NDA. She can't tell you. Like, what, what just from your, from your assessment, what is it like to see a foreman basically say, hey, there's surprises coming, but you shouldn't be too surprised? What, the, what might that indicate about what this grand jury concluded? Well, first, Jason, as a former prosecutor, I cringe any time you see a grand jury four person uh, talking about what happened before the grand jury. There are grand jury secrecy rules to protect people who might be under suspicion. Now, I think she probably complied with the letter of the rule, which says she's not supposed to talk about the grand jury's deliberations. And so she was careful not to say who might be recommended for indictment or, or how that went, went down. But boy, she comes awfully close to that. So it makes me a little bit nervous. But I do think when she says that they recommended that uh, more than a dozen people be indicted, and then in direct response to that question about Donald Trump, she says it's you know it's not going to be too surprising. Um, she's also talked about the phone calls they, they listened to about Donald Trump. So you know I don't know whether they they did or didn't recommend Donald Trump, but uh, it sounds like you know if I were a betting person, I'd bet the answer is yes. See, this is the thing, Kurt, and this is this word. This is where this gets me. All of this is sort of us litigating the criminality and the attempts to overturn the 2020 election. But that pales in comparison to the nonsense we're already seeing for the 2024 election. We've got Ron DeSantis running around, and he's giving speeches. you got Nikki Haley running around. She's giving speeches. And this is my question to you. And I'm going to play you some sound, but I have to set this up properly. In my view, there are three states yet you can't really run from if you're trying to win across America. You run from New York. You're too crazy, you're liberal. You run from California, you're too crazy, you're liberal, you're trying to make sure I can't get plastic straws. You run from <laughs> Florida, it's all crystal meth and alligators, right? Like, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what people think. And I'm not saying that that's the case. I'm saying those are sort of the national reputations of those states. So when you see Ron DeSantis running and claiming that he's going to do for America what he's done in Florida, it seems like that'd be a problem. I'm going to play you some sound from him and then also how that's failed in the past and get your thoughts on the other side. So what have we done in Florida? When they were talking about defunding police and slashing budgets, we said, uh, not on my watch. As much as I'm proud that Florida is doing well, I want the country to do well. I want all of these communities to do well. Now, Kurt, that may make sense in some context. He can talk about policy, right? Mm -hmm. But are those policies the first things that everybody thinks about coming out of Florida? No. I mean, we must have entered some sort of quantum realm here if Ron DeSantis thinks that the entirety of the United States of America wants to have happen in our country what he has done to the state of Florida. If he thinks, for instance, that most of this country, they want to spend their time banning books, if they want to spend their time dealing with mass shootings, if they want to spend their time ignoring the catastrophic impacts of climate change, which, by the way, will hit the state of Florida first, uh, that's not a recipe for a, a good national conversation, a healthy national conversation. And when you factor that in with the 
absolute lunacy we're hearing from the Republican Party overall in the state of Michigan. They just elected a party chair. That's an election denier. We look at what Marjorie Taylor Greene spent the President's Day weekend talking about secession and basically the violent overthrow of government. This is where the Republican Party is at right now. It's not a conversation that the rest of this country wants to have. And you know that just look at the, the lack of interest in the BS investigations that the Republicans are, are running around doing. Every single poll up and down says no one's interested in that, yet they keep doubling down on this failed strategy. Barbara, I'm going to hit you with a political question because I think this is, this, is, this is relevant. We've seen Ron DeSantis use his political power, use policy, threats, government, everything else like that to try to bully Disney, right? He's tried to bully Disney and, and has portrayed them as a company that supports or engages in behavior that leads to criminality. But all that brings to mind to me is a former president who decided he wanted to attack something very popular. I want to play you some sound from Mitt Romney and get your thoughts on the other side. I'm going to stop the subsidy to PBS. I'm going to stop other things. I like PBS. I love Big Bird. I actually like you, too. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to keep on spending money on things to borrow money from China to pay for it. So the guy who said, I'm going to put Big Bird out of a job, ended up not winning. I don't see how the guy who says, I think Disney Plus is the home of groomers and pedophiles, is going to do well. Do you think, Barbara, nationally, that when people look, when, when, when businesses and, 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 and focus groups and lawyers organizations look at how he's using the laws in his state to abuse an entity like Disney, do you think that makes him more popular? Do they, you think that makes organizations want to come to the aid of his potential national campaign? Yeah, you know, there's an interesting divide, I think, in the Republican Party. There is the traditional, you know, Chamber of Commerce business base, and there is uh, sort of the mega Trump group uh, that wants to engage in the culture wars. And I don't know that you can win any state without having both of those constituencies. And so I think the more uh, that uh, Governor Ron DeSantis alienates the Chamber of Commerce business community, I think the less likely he is able to win a state. And, you know, I think nationwide that's uh, that's been true. And so uh, I think at some point, you know, losing those those kinds of business votes is not good politics. You know, Kurt, a lot of times I think Republicans are more interested in the fight than the actual victory. They spent 60 years trying to overthrow abortion. Now they don't know what to do. They're in this fight now with Disney and all sorts of cultural things. But these aren't cultural battles that you can actually win. Where does this actually put someone like Ron DeSantis when he decides to go outside of the sort of bubble of right wing media? How does that play in Texas where people are watching Disney Plus? How does that play in Illinois where people are like, hey, we decided we actually want to go see Ant-Man Quantumania? How does this play out with normal people? It plays out terribly for him. Listen, when you spend more time going after Mickey Mouse than after, than after like mass shootings, there's a problem there. There's a complete disconnect with where real people and real parents are at. When you spend more time banning books and going after curriculum and inventing scare tactics to try to justify what is an outright white nationalist racist agenda, you're alienating a large swath of the population. You, you are fundamentally unelectable outside of your little bubble. And we're seeing now with the veneer Fox News being pierced recently, with all the revelations about what they really think about what's going on in the country and how different that is from what they present publicly, the, the, anytime they have to go outside of that world, it's not good. They just fold, and they don't know how to talk about things beyond that world. Ron DeSantis will go up on a debate stage one day, and you will see him vulnerable. You will see him tripping over himself. You will see him not be able to put together a comprehensive, coherent thought, because he doesn't know how to do that. Apparently, it is a small media world, after all, in the right wing, and Ron DeSantis is trapped in it. Kurt Bardella and Barbara McQuaid, thank you so much for joining us tonight.